especially encouraging slash troubling when you consider the transient nature of our church community. So the 17% growth includes the, the, the 6 to 8% that we lose every year. So every year, 6 to 8% of our members are leaving and moving on to other places that are here for a short time. So the net is 17% growth. But the growth, obviously, is higher, depending on what that is. Now, this is great. It is great that God is working. It's great you're inviting people. It's great. But I see three problems when I see the church getting this big. And here's what I say the three pitfalls of growth. Community, evangelism, and pastoral care. All things that I believe are foundational to the church, the body of Christ. When the church gets this big, first of all, community starts to suffer. It used to be when a church is 150, 200 people, 250, you knew everybody, you saw everybody, if somebody wasn't there, you noticed. When someone knew was there, you shook their hand. Now when the church is this big, so many people would be like, you know, so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, no, he was here. And they're like, well, I didn't see him. I said, well, because you, I, sat, I sat on the right side, well, he sat on the left side. And if you're on the right side and the left side, you're never going to see each other. It's like living in another state with your that side and that side. All right? And so often nowadays, it's difficult to catch people, difficult, difficult because our, 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 our numbers are getting big, which is a great thing. But I get afraid when community starts to decrease. Okay? Churches are supposed to be a family. Second is evangelism. Friends and family, you know how we used to do it when back in that Hilton? We used to say, we we're going to put out double the number of chairs. Which wasn't a big deal when you had 100, okay? You put like 180, but really double, but you put, you know, a little bit plus or minus. So you put from 100 to 180. And again, 180 is, is, is this, okay? Right now we have 360 chairs here, so 180 would be half. So we would have 100 normally, and we would add another 80. We would say, you know what? Church is going to look really dumb if all these chairs are empty. Everybody go and bite somebody. Could we do that today? Could we say we got 360 chairs? Next week, we're going to ask the agent, we'll go 720 chairs. Could we do that? Where are we going to put extra chairs here today? So you look around and you say, well, I would invite, but there's really no place. Evangelism goes down. And then the last one is pastoral care. We, the Orthodox Church, our concept of church is not just this. Like, this is great. We all love this. But true church is this. Is this. Like, y'all call me Father. Okay, your father is supposed to know your name. That's one of the rules. Like, in my house, I have two people who call me father. I know both their names. And I know everything about their life. Okay, because I'm their father. Same supposed to be in the church. Maybe not everything about their life, but it's supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one connection. We believe very much in that. And as the church grows, it's much more difficult to have that one-on-one -on -one connection. So that's why it's never been our vision to be like a mega church. It's never been our vision to be huge. It's not the vision to be like, can we get like a thousand seats? Can we build a church for a thousand people? That is not our vision. Our vision is not 5,000, 1,000, not even 500. The vision is probably a little bit smaller than this, to be honest. Because you didn't come here if it wasn't for these things. You came here, what you love about this church is that we are a family, that we do know each other, that are not just a, a, a name, or not just a number. You love about this church is that you can invite your friends here. And there's a place for them, and you don't feel uncomfortable. Wait, can I invite my friends? Is he going to find me? See, it's going to be awkward. But you can walk and find a place. And you love the pastoral care. You came here because you wanted a one-on-one -on -one relationship with me as your priest. And you want someone who knows your name. So therefore, we need to get smaller while we get bigger. How are we going to get smaller? Kick out the people on the right do like a, like, who are we going to vote off the island? Here's how we're going to get smaller while getting big. Our solution to this problem is ordain more priests and have more locations. Ordain more priests and have more locations. And we took the first step of that today. If those of you here during the liturgy, okay, we nominated me and a fam to be our next priest. Okay, we did the, the voting, and you know, we'll see how the voting goes. You all have to say your opinion, and God willing, that all goes well, be able to ordain Nina as a priest. And then, hopefully, be able to ordain more priests and start more locations. The goal is not, listen carefully to this one, the goal is not that I build this big church and I'm the guy and then big, this big empire called STSA, which I own. That's never been the vision from the start and it'll never be the vision. I don't want that responsibility or that workload. What I want to see is more churches in different locations with one vision. One STSA vision, but in different places. Imagine this. Imagine two families, identical families. Two families 
you know, middle class, whatever, you know, father works at whatever job, mother this, two kids, you know, bratty son, you know, teenage girl, whatever, with whatever. Like, they're two identical families. They're identical in everything. They both love God. They both want to be close to God. They want to serve God. Everything's identical. One of them lives 40 miles from their church. And their church, let's say that's an hour drive to the church. And their church has a thousand people. And the priest barely remembers their name. That's one family. The other family lives four miles from the church. Ten minute drive. There's 250 people in their church. And they have, or the priest knows them very well, visited them probably twice in the past year. Those two families. Are they going to have the same relationship with the church? Are they going to look the same? Let's say I go to both these families. And I say, hey, church is doing this event on Wednesday night. And it's going to be a lot of fun and really edifying. They're going to have the same reaction. Let's say I say, there's a women's event on Friday night. And let's say I say, there's a men's thing on Saturday morning. Let's say I say, hey, the church needs someone to come a little bit early. The church needs someone to stay a little bit late. Let's say I say, hey, everybody needs to make sure they're practicing confession regularly. And let's say I said, everybody, I want to... <clears throat> I want to come visit you, or you want me to come. Are these two families going to have the same relationship with the church? Not even close. Not even close. The church is going to grow. Because it's the church. We can't say, you know what? Church is big enough. Anyone else wants to come? Forget you. We don't care. We're big enough. If that's our attitude, then we have a serious problem. Then we're no more the church. Because we are the body of Christ. So if Christ would never say, forget you, then we as church, we are a church, we're going to invite people, we don't care where. We're going to always be growing, we're going to always be growing. we got to find ways to get smaller about getting bigger. we got to find ways to, instead of adding a row of chairs, is there a way that we can add a room of chairs? And is there a way we can make that room closer to where the people are? And is there a way we can have multiple rooms, not again, not adding more rows to everyone be around me, this is where we have multiple rooms to be close to where the people are and have the same vision. Is it possible? I believe it's possible. Now, the key to doing that will be how can we recreate what we have here in multiple locations? And that process has begun. That's actually the second point of our vision. The second thing we want to do during this coming year is we want to help others without hurting ourselves. Help others without hurting ourselves. We want to get smaller while getting bigger. We want to help others without hurting ourselves. You guys know there's this verse in the Bible, which all these superhero movies, they rip it off. Okay, but it's from the Bible. Jesus said it first. And to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. I believe that's true in every aspect of life. I believe that financially, that to whom much is given, much is required. That those who have been blessed financially were blessed in order to be a blessing to others. I believe that spiritually, that those who have been blessed spiritually are not just to be selfish with it, but we are there to bless others spiritually. And I believe that as a church. And I believe that God has blessed our church. We have the best congregation in the whole wide world. We got something really special right here. We got something really special right here. And I believe that we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. Did you know that on a weekly basis, weekly basis, I get at least one email per week. Maybe not one. Okay, let me be more conservative. At least one every two to three weeks, and sometimes much more frequently. An email from a priest, or another church member, okay, or a youth group leader, or whatever it may be, from another church, saying, Father Anthony, can you help us? And the requests vary. A lot of them are, come and visit us. We don't have a priest who we can relate to. We want you to come visit us. Some of them are, tell us how you do this in your church. And tell us how you do groups. And you have this thing called membership group. What's that like? How is it that you invite people to your church? Like, what do you do in the well? Like, how does it work? You guys have staff. Like, how does that work? I get so many requests. I get requests from people say, can you send us two or three priests just like you? As if they, like, they grow on the trees, okay? <laughs> and then what I discovered a couple months ago, okay, this has been happening to me for a long, long time, but what I discovered a couple months ago is not just me. I discovered our staff is getting the same request. How is it you guys have this thing called the Connection Team? And I heard that your church was, can you tell us how you do that? Can you sit with us and tell us how your finances do? Can you tell us how you guys did your core values and how you did like all that mission statement stuff? Like, tell us how you did that. If I tell you the number of requests that we get from churches to help us, let me ask you a question. How 
How should we respond? How should I? I'm asking you. I'm your priest. How should I respond? There's two options. Option number one is I say yes to every request. And I run to help every single person who asks me to help. And every person who wants to talk about every single detail, spend an hour on the phone with that guy, take a plane, go visit that guy, do all that stuff. What will be the end result of that? I will be hurting our church. Because again, I don't have a limited hours. So for me to help somebody, for me to spend an hour here, means an hour less here. So I could help every single person that asks, but the end result of that is I hurt the church. So then let me go to the other extreme. And let me say, again, forget you to everybody else. I don't care about anybody else. I got my own church. I don't need this headache. Like, I'm ordained right here. I'm not ordained. So I don't care. I'm just going to be selfish. Is that a godly response as well? I think we got to find a way to help others. Not be selfish, but without hurting ourselves. Y'all agree with me? The answer to that, the answer to that is something called STSA Ministries, which I spoke about in the vision night. But let me recap for those who weren't there and talk about a little bit more. What we want to do is we want to create a separate nonprofit organization. So we are STSA Church. We want to create something called STSA Ministries. STSA Ministries would kind of be like an umbrella organization. And basically the purpose of STSA Ministries is not to help our church, but to help the church. And to be a ministry that can help the church globally or, or nationally, whatever it may be, beyond our local scope. Which means we want to make available a lot of the resources we have. Like I said, we have done this membership group thing for a while. It's time for us to package it up and make it available to others. We do these things called life groups. So when you want to be part of that, time for us to make those a little bit more professional, package them up and help others do the same. People ask, like, how do you start up a church? How do you guys do the well? Give us tips on this stuff. How do you assimilate new people in? How do you... All these things that we do right here. Let me tell you what breaks my heart. So many people out there love the idea of STSA. That's why you love it too. That's why you're here. So many people love the idea. That's why many people come visit from all over the place. What pains me is people love the idea. Go and try to recreate it without the proper resources and materials. Because they think that it can just be done like that. And then what happens is the, 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 the venture fails. And then people think the whole idea is a failure. That pains me. So we want to help people to be successful. And we want to help those who are struggling. And just so you think that, just so you know, I'm not making this up. Just so you know, just yesterday, just yesterday, and I printed out the email in case you want the timestamp. I got this email just yesterday. I'll read you the email, but I'll take out some of the names, of course. Just yesterday. Okay, it's January 19th, 101 p.m. This is the email I got. Uh, happy Epiphany, Marianne, the kids, yada, 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 miss you, whatever. Um, father, and then they say the name of the priest. Their priest, a new priest in, in their town, asked myself and my husband to start an outreach ministry to spread the faith and bring more cop, non-cops and non-Egyptians to our church. He asked me to reach out to you, since we used to serve together in the past, and check how do you do it, your experience, your knowledge, etc. I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, correct? And knowing you, you probably have it all organized somewhere. We want to leverage what you've listened to this sentence. We want, just you think I'm not making this stuff up. We want to leverage what you've learned and implemented in STSA. Any information will be helpful if we're really not sure where to start. Congratulations, you want to have a baby. How am I supposed to respond to this? How am I supposed to respond to this? We want to leverage what you've learned and implemented. What she's asking, what this person is asking, what they want, is a phone call with me that will probably take at least an hour. We'll probably a follow up another hour. And probably a visit. Like they, what they're asking for, they need it. And I got it. But I don't know if I got the time to do this and this at the same time. So what's the answer to this nice lady? The answer to STSA Ministries is that we put something together, professional, to help those who want to start churches, want to start outreaches, those who are struggling in their current, how we do Sunday school, how we do things like the well, things like that. We have to do something about it. And just so you know here, just so you know that I'm not saying like I'm the expert. I heard this nice expression from another pastor. He says, my goal here is not to fill your cup, but it's simply to empty my cup. So I'm not going to go to this lady and give her everything she needs to run her church. I can't do that. I cannot fill her cup. But I can certainly empty my cup. And I can certainly give everything that I know, and then she can take it, and she can run with it. And she can make it even better. 
And that's the goal of STSA Ministries, is to empty our cup. But we must find a way to do so without hurting ourselves. 1 John 3, verse 17. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does love of God abide in him? Now, let me say this. I realize this idea may rub some people the wrong way, and it's a new idea, and some people are skeptical. Like, is this allowed? Like, aren't you supposed to, like, just do everything for everyone? Like, is this, is this legit or not legit? Let me address the skeptics on two sides of the argument. First, there's those who would say, forget about the others, we should just focus on ourselves. It's none of our business, we've got a big congregation right here, all of our efforts should be right here, forget about those people. First of all, we already agree that's selfish and that can't be from God. But let me tell you this. I believe that helping other churches will directly benefit our church. Directly benefit our church. How? Let me ask you this question. How many people are sure? How many people are sure? Y'all love STSA Church. You love being a member of this church. How many people are sure that you will be in this D.C. metropolitan area 10 years from now? How many people are sure that your kids are going to grow up and stay in this area and live here forever? Answer, zero. Okay, and even I wouldn't raise my hand, even though I've been here my entire life. But I wouldn't raise my hand just to enter the nature of life in this area. So you have a vested interest in helping to see the vision of STSA grow to other places. You may move to North Carolina. You may move to uh, New York. You may move to Oklahoma. You may move to Vermont, but you may move to other places. So every one of us has an interest in seeing the vision of STSA grow beyond just these four walls right here. If you think you're going to be here forever, you know, I know it's here forever. And I'll tell you a story. I told this on that one on the scope that I did one night for this one there. There's a guy named Stephen Huxell. Anyone know who Stephen Huxell is? Or you know Stephen Huxell? Just the old school people who know him. Stephen Huxell was the first member, or the first person to be baptized into this church back in 2013. Great guy. Loves God. Discovered orthodoxy. All in. Best guy. And then he moved. And he moved to a series of cities. I remember one was Vancouver. Somewhere else on the northwest on the American side. Now he's in Texas. He was a couple, couple stops in between. Steve Huxley hasn't found a church community that he's been in since he left here. And it breaks my heart. I just talked to him a couple weeks ago. And I told him, you know what, try this Orthodox church. Try this Catholic church. Try this, you know, non-denominational church. He hasn't found a church community that, that he's been into. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say this, he has visited many other Coptic churches, and many other non-Coptic but Orthodox churches. And I'm sorry to say, he's never found a home. And I don't blame, I'm not, I'm not saying that like a, I'm taking it in a derogatory way, but what I'm saying is, the vision that we have at SCSA here fits the Stephen Huxley's. But Stephen Huxley moved. So what do we do about him? We say, you know what? Tough luck. Either move back here, or we don't care about you. Like, is that a godly place to say? And now you want me to say to you? Like, I care about you as long as you, but you go somewhere else. I don't care about you. And, and if you want, you got to come here. we got to find a way to bring our same mission vision across to other churches. Let me go to the opposite. Skeptic. The other skeptic is the one who says, I agree, we should help everybody, and we should do it for free. Because when I said STS Ministries, by the way, I was talking about patching those things up and selling them and making making money off it. But not for profit, but really just to be able to do it more professionally. Some people would say, we shouldn't do anything, we should do everything for free. This is a person who lives in the land of unicorns, gave okay, rainbows, okay, and where money just grows on trees. And I would love, I would love it. You come here and give me $10 million, $20 million, we do everything for free. Okay, but in the real world, the truth is, is things cost money. And if we are going to produce things at a high quality, it takes resources. Now, with that said, let me be very clear. I can say this to the camera for those who are going to be watching this online later. Everything that is free right now will continue to remain free. Everything is free. So we're not going to start charging to watch our videos. The whole point is not to charge for what we do already. The whole point is to do more stuff that will take more resources and therefore require us to charge to be able to do it. Right now, you can watch the video of the well on Sunday afternoon sometime. Sometimes it comes a little late, whatever it may be. We don't want to give people just the well to watch online. We want to give people the resources and the ability to do the well in their own church. We don't want to just tell everybody, 
Come here, we need this conference called Momentum right here. Come here, come here. We want to give people the resources to be able to do it wherever they are. We don't want to just tell everyone, we got it figured out right here. We want to be able to tell people, here's how you can do it in your church. Said simply, we don't want to just give people fish. We want to teach people how to become fishermen themselves. I love this verse from Ephesians 4.12. It's kind of like the theme verse for SCC Ministries. Equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and for edifying of the body of Christ. That's our goal, is to help others be successful, equipping and edifying. A few years back, this is a story that I'm sure many of you guys know. I'm not saying any names, but I mean in a derogatory way. There was a shoe company that every time they sold a pair of shoes, they donated a pair of shoes to an impoverished uh, village somewhere in, in Africa. Okay, I'm sure you all know what it is, but we can see. And they were hailed for their philanthropy, okay, and seen as the greatest thing. And their intentions were great. I'm not, not in any way saying their intentions were bad. But there's some, many, if you look online, you can read the articles, who say actually the impact they had on the local community in Africa was actually negative, not positive. Because while they did a great job of giving a shoe, and giving a shoe, and giving a shoe, and giving a shoe, the economy is kind of like a delicate ecosystem that has to be in balance. And by giving away shoes, they hurt the overall economy. How? Who did they hurt specifically? Shoe makers and shoe fixers. And by putting those guys basically out of business, okay, they hurt the economy. You can read more about the long-term impact of giving resources for free versus what is a better way, those who are in the area of development, international development, understand this stuff, is that instead of giving away stuff for free, but help people to do it themselves, what would have been a better thing than giving away a thousand shoes? Get the thousand shoes. Help them build a factory and invest the money in the people there so that they themselves can build better shoes. And the economy there can be, but this takes more resources. This is easy. Here's a thousand shoes. This is hard, but this is long term. And this is what helps them and, and help them to be successful by teaching them how to fish. I believe that STSA has had tremendous impact over the past seven years in helping lots of individuals outside our church community. But imagine the impact of we're not just helping individuals, but we can help churches. Imagine instead of just getting emails. And I get these emails all the time. And I hate them, to be honest. Listen to this. I'm going to tell you an email that I hate. I hate the email that says, Father Anthony, you're the best. Father Anthony, we love you. Father Anthony, every Sunday, we look forward to listening to your sermon watching your video. We hate going to our local church. You're the highlight of our Sunday. I hate that. I hate that. Because that's not my goal. To make people love me, I would much, much, much rather them love their church and not even know my name. I would love them to go and say, you know what, Father Anthony, it's been a while since watched your videos. You know why? Because we go to our church, and our church is the best. And you know what? Our church, we invite people to our church and say, this is the best place. Forget about Father Anthony. He's the old guy. He's got the, the thing, okay, the, the, the walker. Okay, come visit our church. I would love that. I hate hearing our church Sunday school stinks. Our kids hate it. They only like it when they come to your church. I hate hearing that. I would love them to say, you know what? Our kids love going to our Sunday school. I want to help them to build. I wish people love it. You know what I hate most? Live every year. I'm not saying this. Okay, again, I'll say it to the camera for people watching online. This is you. I'm not saying I hate you. I hate this. Every year, Holy Week, we have people come from out of town and say, we don't like to spend Holy Week anywhere other than your church. I hate that. I love you, but I hate that. I want them to say, you know what, our church used to be difficult for Holy Week, but now it's the best. I want to get to the point where I'm not just making people love me and build themselves around me and say, Father Anthony, you're the best. I want them to love their local church. And I want there to be local churches everywhere. People say, our priest is the best. No, our, I want people to fight. My priest is the best. No, my priest is the best. No, our Sunday school is the best. No, our Sunday school. And then I want the whole, you know, rape my priest thing, okay? I want that to come up. People giving, like, I, I, I want, that's what I want. It's the only way we're going to get there is we have to learn to help others without hurting ourselves. This is where we're going. We've already started to share this idea. We're going to start sharing this idea more. This idea hasn't rolled out yet. Okay, where we are right now is in kind of the planning phase and the gathering interest and support and financial support specifically. It's going to take a lot to do all the stuff that we want to do, but we believe that God is faithful. So right now where we are is trying to spread the idea. So if you know somebody who would back this idea and say, you know what, I believe in this idea and support this idea, let us know. 
we would love for people to get on board from the early stages as we try to shape this, this mission. Okay? So, first number one. First thing we want to do this year is we want to get smaller while getting bigger. We want to grow smaller while getting bigger. Second thing we want to do is we want to help others without hurting ourselves. And then the last one that we want to do, and this is just for all of us, this is for you as well. We want to take faith-filled risks versus live in fear-filled comfort. I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that what we want to do during this coming year is going to open us up, and specifically me, when I say us, I'm saying me. Open me up to criticism. Open me up to people, open us up for people to say they're getting ahead of themselves, they think very highly of themselves. I know that. And the easiest thing for me to do is just say, you know what? I don't care. I just focus on myself. That'd be an easy thing to do. But I know and you know that nothing great ever happened in life. Nothing great ever happened in life. We want to be great. Nothing great happened in life without somebody taking a step of faith and taking a risk. There's a great story in Luke chapter 9 of a guy who gets invited. The invitation of a lifetime. Maybe you've read this passage before. You should have realized how this invitation, like the best thing that you could possibly hear in life, this guy heard, but he didn't respond the right way. He, being Jesus, said to this random guy, we don't even know his name, just some random guy, Jesus walking down the road, and Jesus finds this guy, Jesus says to him, follow me. Follow me. And I'm going to show you this guy's response in a second. When Jesus says to this guy, follow me, something is dangling in the air. This guy's entire future, his eternal future as well, is dangling in the air, is hanging in the balance to how he's going to respond to this. He says this. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus says to him something which we think is kind of offensive today, but I don't understand the context. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. We read that and we're like, hey, Jesus, like, go easy on the God. That we don't understand the context. When he says, let me go bury my father, is his father dead? His father's not dead. If his father was dead, it's not like today when someone dies, and then you bury them a week later. Okay, those who in an old country, it's like that. Someone dies, 15 minutes later, they bury him. They bury him on the spot. So this guy's not saying, my dad just died, let me go to the funeral. That would be insensitive for Jesus to say. What this guy is saying is like, like I got stuff going on. And like, maybe I got some investments over here, and I'm trying these new things, so I kind of want to follow you, Jesus, but let me just kind of handle my business, and I'll get there eventually, but just give me some time. And Jesus said to him, as you heard right there, let the dead bury their own dead. Next. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you. Meaning like, forget about that putz over there, that schmuck, love, take me, I'll follow you. But just let me first go and bid them farewell over at my house. That's a simple request. Let me just go and say bye to mom and dad. But Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back straight for the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this question. Let's just hypothetically speak. Imagine. What are those two guys thinking right now? What are they thinking right now? You're putz number one, or putz number two. Your life is over. We don't know your name. Okay, so we're just calling you number one and number two. You're looking back. What are you thinking? You met this guy, Jesus, one day. This random guy. We just said, follow him. And you didn't think much of him. And you said no. And then you see him. And there he is walking on water. <laughs> he just turned water into wine. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. He just raised himself from the dead. Kevin, which one? You were thinking. I missed the opportunity of a lifetime. When Jesus said, follow me, he said, come be one of my disciples. You could have been with Peter. You could have been with James. You could have been with John. You could have been with Judas. You could have been with, with Simon. Like, you could have been with those guys. You could have been one of those guys. Like those guys that everybody names their kids after. The guys that we have hanging on the walls in the churches. 
You're going to be with those guys. You're going to be one of the 12. You didn't realize what hung in the balance is. You were so focused on, I don't want to give this up. I don't want to take this risk. And I say to you this. The true risk isn't in stepping out in faith. The real risk is in staying faith. The real risk isn't in stepping out. The real risk is in staying faith. And I believe that for you as an individual, I believe that for us as a church. The real risk that we are taking is not if we step out in faith and say yes to God. The real risk is if we stay faith and say we'll see. I can't help I can't help as we stand here in 2019 and looking at the road ahead looking back just 8 years ago which seems like an eternity 8 years ago before we started STSA I was a priest at a very large church multiple priests big office well, office in case <laughs> office would be nice all the way the craft I had a very comfortable life very stable I had a very comfortable life. Everything was easy. Everything was good. My house was five minutes from the church. My kids went to the school there. Like, everything was easy. Everything was good. But I had this nudge inside me. This little thing inside me which said, you need to leave. And it wasn't leave for the sake of leave. It was because I had this little nudge inside me that God wanted me to help bring an ancient faith to a modern world. And that we need to take a step in bringing an ancient faith because I believe this ancient faith is so beautiful. And I believe it should not be limited to those who just grew up in it. It should not be limited to those who speak a certain language. Or those who have a certain ethnicity. And that little nudge was inside me. That little nudge was inside me. And it was very difficult for me to listen to that nudge. And those who know the story, those who are back in the time or heard me in the membership group tell the story. It took a lot for God to convince me. It actually took a medical situation. Well, somebody reminded me I'm in a medical situation right now as well. But that medical situation, I didn't listen. That medical situation got pretty bad. To the point where I had no, no, chance, no choice but to listen to God, to hear his voice. And I took that step. And God resolved things as he always does. And I said, I'm going to leave this big, comfortable church. Nice salary, everything comfortable, everything easy. I'm going to leave that. And I'm going to start a church in a hotel. I have no money. No members, but I got a lot of jokes. <laughs> and that's how we started the church. And I remember to this day, I remember, to this day, I remember, there's a priest. Like, I made that announcement, and then it was like four months until we actually started. So during that four months, people were heard to the grapevine, because sometimes people talk and get angry. The priest would call me. What happened? Did you get kicked out? Someone's fighting, fighting, accusing you? And I'm like, no, I'm leaving. You're like, no, for, you, cool, we know you're not leaving. But what kind of idiot would want to start a church in a hotel? Like, what happened? And tell us, we'll defend you. And I'm like, no, nah, everything's good. But one priest in particular, one priest in particular, said he wanted to meet with you. And he flew in. He flew in. Okay, from wherever he was flying around. He flew in. I'm to meet with you. And it's urgent. Well, what, what can I do for you? And he said, he's meet with you. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I heard about this. Yeah, it's great. And I'm excited. We're going to do this. We're going to bring Asian to the modern world. We're going to he's like, no, 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 seriously, is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, everything's fine. We're sitting, I'm just like, we're sitting at this big conference table, okay? Like, we're sitting on us, like, in one of the other games of He goes, and I'm trying to convince him how excited I am, okay, to start this new church. And I'm excited to leave, and I'm excited, and I'm excited. He took a business card, got chopped. He took a business card. He goes, okay, I'll just leave this with you. And he basically was offering me a job. He was wanting me to come work with him, go do a priest with him. He said, okay, I'll just leave this with you. Okay, and if you ever change your mind, you have my information. I was like, what? Like, I'm really confused. Tell him how excited I am. And he couldn't believe that I, that I would be excited to leave a big church and everyone else trying to get to a big church. And I'm going to leave a big church. But I had no choice. Because I believe the risk, and I experienced it, was not stepping out. The risk was in staying put. And when God gives you a vision, God puts it in front of you. And when God says, this is what I'm calling you to do. But God, people will say. But God, people will think. But God, this might happen. The true all risks. But you know a greater risk? Is to be those suckers who lose time. You don't even know their name. You miss the opportunity of life. 
So that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we're going all in in 2019. We're all in. We have a vision, and we're going all in. We're going to get bigger while getting smaller. We're going to help others without hurting ourselves. We're not going to be afraid to take risks. Faith-filled risks, not foolish risks. But it is more risky than we need to live in fear and comfort. The reason that I'm here and that you're here is not to be comfortable. The reason that I left that church is not to be comfortable. The reason I left that church, the reason I started STSA, and the reason that you're here is because we believe that God's calling us to something great. And when God is calling, we will say yes. We will never say no to God. We will never say oh, it's too hard. We'll never say it's too risky. We believe that God has given us much. And we believe that our ancient faith, which God knows, ancient faith, which made me fall in love with you, is too good to keep to ourselves. So we will walk in faith and we'll see what God does. I want to wrap up here by bringing you a prayer from a man named Drake. Sir Francis Drake. <laughs> Sir Francis Drake. Well, that would have been a risk. That would have been, that's not a faith builder. That's a key. Sir Francis Drake says, Disturb us, O Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true, because we have dreamed too little. We have arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. So it is my prayer for you, my prayer for us as a church, that we would not be afraid to take risks for God, that we would be challenging ourselves to do big things so that God can do even bigger things through us and in us this coming year. Let's stand together to In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one body in heaven. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us, all the blessings that you've given us to get us to stand here in 2019. Lord, as we look ahead, we're excited about what you want to do. We know, Lord, that when you do stuff through us, that we, as the vessels, will be the ones who are most blessed. So give us, Lord, the vision that we need, not just for the church, but for our families, for our careers, for all of our lives. And give us the faith take steps, leaving our comfort zone, but knowing in full faith, Lord, that we say yes to you, you will never let us down. We pray these things in the mighty name of your Son, the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Here's as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. In Christ Jesus our Lord, and that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.